Boldwood presents The Couple Across the Street Written by Anita Waller and read by Leslie Harcourt The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Murder is always a mistake. One should never do anything that one cannot talk about after dinner. Oscar Wilde, 1854-1900 to 1900. Through violence you may murder the hater, but you do not murder the hate. Martin Luther King Jr., 1929-1968 to 1968. Prologue, July 2003 There was a silence in the hospital side room that was like no other. It was marred occasionally by the slight snuffle from Eloise Grantham as she had, despite wanting to stay awake, slipped into a troubled sleep. She needed the child in the bed to open his eyes, to begin his journey back to health, to prove that the awful car smash wouldn't take his life. Both the nurse and the grandmother missed the first visible signs of awakening from the young boy. Josiah Grantham's eyes twitched before opening, then flickered, then closed again. It was enough for the moment. Eloise's head dropped to one side and she woke with a start, guilt enveloping her as she realised she had slept. Her eyes travelled instantly to her grandson, this most precious child, and saw that she had missed nothing. He was still... But today, hopefully today, he would start to exit the awful tunnel he seemed to be in. Eloise needed him to come back to her, to show her that she hadn't lost a very precious part of her. She reached to the foot of the bed and unhooked the medical chart. Josiah John Grantham, date of birth 25th of December 1999, parent Kirsty Grantham. She gently stroked her fingers across his name, it had been a difficult Christmas, that one six years earlier, but the tiny baby placed in her arms at the end of Christmas Day had made the half-cooked turkey worth all the effort. How she and Kirsty had laughed as they had tried to lift the turkey, now surrounded by potatoes as they began their journey of being roasted, but the extra weight had proved their undoing. As Kirsty had bent to help slide the roasting tin back into the oven, her waters had broken, and this wonderful boy lying in the bed had arrived with ten minutes of Christmas Day still to enjoy. No daddy to share the joy of the moment. In fact, no daddy ever admitted to exist. And in that moment of Eloise holding her grandchild for the first time, it hadn't mattered. She and Kirsty would be enough for this wondrous being. And now there was currently no Kirsty to hold her boy lost inside a coma that everyone hoped would end. Eloise clung to the hope extended by the doctors that this child would surface when his body was ready, just as his mother hopefully would. But she was so scared, scared she would lose both of them. She reached out to grasp his hand, the one that didn't have a cannula inserted in it, and she prayed. As she had prayed ever since the police had called to tell her of the accident on the M1. Kirsty, unconscious in the Northern General Hospital, her child in a similar condition in the Children's Hospital, and all because Kirsty had wanted to take him to Meadowhall to see a movie. Between visits to her daughter in one hospital and her vigils at Jed's bedside in the Children's Hospital, the details of the smash had slowly emerged. A tyre blowout in a jeep that had been overtaking Kirsty's car at 90 miles an hour had caused the jeep to veer towards her, flip her own much smaller fiesta over for it to be hit by a white van that simply couldn't stop in time to avoid the car. The car carrying everything that Eloise loved in the world. Kirsty had died at the scene but had been resuscitated by skilled paramedics. Six-year-old Jed had been strapped into the back seat. He'd suffered a head injury, some spectacular bruising and a broken arm. All mendable if he would only wake up and begin his climb back to being the wonderful child she had loved from the moment of his birth. 
The second time he opened his eyes, she whispered his name and gently squeezed his fingers. He squeezed back, but didn't speak. Just closed his eyes once more, hiding away the bright blue that was so dear to his grandmother. Half an hour later, he opened his eyes again, and the nurse held a sippy cup to his lips. After the drink that moistened his lips and throat, he spoke. Granny, he said. Jed's climb back to health had begun. Chapter One, September 2022. Claire Staines was feeling muddled. Her mind was struggling to cope with this unusual for her feeling, and really it had been mainly caused by Auntie Frieda. Auntie Frieda had lost her husband some 15 years earlier, and he was all she talked about, all Frieda thought about. She loved him still and would quite obviously grieve for him for the rest of her life. Now a reluctant and doddery 70 years of age, she had been 53 when he died. Claire's age now. And Claire was pretty sure Auntie Frieda had never felt any sort of muddlement about her love for the late Uncle Joe. She had been steadfast, dusted his photograph frames every two days, and went to simply sit and chat to him at his graveside at least once every week. She had loved him then, and she loved him still. Claire had lost John, her own much-loved husband eight months earlier, in January of 2022, to cancer. The muddle in her mind was caused by the fact that she thought she was over it. Her life had changed, and she had welcomed the alterations to her routine. In fact, she didn't appear to have any routine. That had gone by the wayside. She shouldn't feel like this. She should be visiting his grave every week and plying him with roses, talking to him, telling him what was going on in their lives, hers and the lives of their two daughters, saying over and over again how much she loved and missed him. In other words, she felt she should be emulating Auntie Frieda. She did for the first couple of months. She grieved, she coped sporadically, not wholly. It had been a month since she last took John some flowers, and they weren't exactly roses, just a hurriedly picked bunch of assorted blooms from the garden, whatever looked quite fresh, really. Did she tell him she had started a yoga class? She didn't think she had. Or had made tentative inquiries about the creative writing group that met at the village hall every month? She didn't think she'd actually told him anything. She had intended to talk to him about the progress of the purchase of Grace and Megan's new home, cementing their affiliation even further, but knowing how she hadn't really been able to discuss the relationship between the two women while he'd been alive caused her to think twice about mentioning it now at his graveside. She remembered taking his old flowers to the rubbish container, filling the metal vase with fresh water and carrying it back to the grave, then arranging the fresh flowers so they looked nice, but she couldn't remember speaking about anything at all. Not a word of conversation had left her mouth. Did she say goodbye as she left? Did she make her usual promise to see him soon? Did she at any point say, I love you? Did she finger kiss the very new white marble headstone as she always did? The questions rattled around her brain as she realized she remembered very little about her last visit. It had felt almost as if it was expected of her to turn up routinely with flowers and say all the right things, except... She had said nothing. This couldn't be right. She couldn't be over him as quickly as this. They'd known each other since infant school, been married for 33 years. Claire felt she simply couldn't have got over his cruel death so soon. Wasn't he the love of her life? And why did these feelings of guilt keep washing over her every time she thought about doing something she knew she would enjoy doing? John had always been a little controlling, and now suddenly the chains seemed to have been removed, and she was feeling guilty because of that. Surely not. Sarah and Grace would be horrified if they knew how her mind was working. They adored their father, as did Claire, 
which made it all the more peculiar that she was having these feelings now, or not having feelings, if Claire really thought about it with any depth. She really was muddled. She actually felt quite angry towards John, because she wasn't normally a muddled person. She was convinced that this, in some way, was his fault as well as Auntie Frieda's. Claire was usually quite composed, knew what she wanted from life, and she didn't like this troublesome state of her mind. She couldn't talk to the girls about it, they just wouldn't understand. They would be hurt and she would let nothing on earth hurt her girls. Claire's closest and best friend was Vicky Dolan, but she wasn't even sure she could tell her about this unsettlement. Vic wasn't happy with Rob, her own dearly beloved who had, for the last two or three years, dropped down the rankings in Vic's life. No, Claire really couldn't burden her with stories of her muddle. Vic had enough to worry about. She had muddled feelings of her own. When John's cancer was first diagnosed in October 2020, Claire and John had taken the decision to keep it from the girls, temporarily at least, partly because Zara was due to marry Greg two weeks after, and partly because Grace, along with Megan King, her partner, had booked a holiday and were due to fly to the States three days after her sister's wedding. Vic was Claire's rock, her support system. Claire knew she had to tell someone. So one night, three days before the wedding, she broke down at Vic's kitchen table. They talked and talked and talked, none of it making much sense, because once the words 18 months maximum had been said, nothing seemed to make sense. John rang while they were talking. He knew just from the pain in his wife's voice what was keeping her out so late. Stay as long as you need, sweetheart, he had said softly. I love you. It was about a month after this that they finally told Zara and Greg, Grace and Megan. Their reactions were quite dissimilar. Sarah, their ever-practical Sarah, immediately began researching to see if anything could be done to halt, reverse, wipe out this horrific thing that was happening to her father. And her younger sister fell apart. Grace felt anger, sorrow, uncertainty. Every emotion that could possibly be conjured up, she conjured it up. Megan was her mainstay, her proverbial tower of strength, guiding her at every turn in the road, whether it be good or bad. Claire remembered Sarah screaming at the computer screen one night while she was searching online. What do you mean, palliative care? This is fucking 2021. There should be a fucking cure. She had turned to Claire with a haunted look in her eyes. I'm sorry, Mum. Sorry for the language. And they'd sob together, understanding all too well the frustration behind her words. Claire thought that was the evening when the enormity of it all had hit them the hardest. As they watched John deteriorate, there was a subtle shift in the girls. Grace grew stronger, more focused on helping her mother cope with the day-to-day -day problems, and Sarah slowly withdrew into herself. The unhappiness in their lives had been hidden from John, but he wasn't a stupid man. He knew. He recognised the heartache in his daughters and the eventual acceptance in his wife that she would be widowed at 53, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. When John died in the hospice on the 23rd of January, they became a three-sided unit. The church was packed for his funeral, but the three women banded together, totally united in their grief. Greg and Megan stood by, waiting to console them when it all became too much to bear on their own. The loss of this man, the strength holding their home and lives together, was such an immense thing. The combined love of that triangular unit made their family stronger, their closeness closer. The wake had been a gathering of their friends, along with many golfing acquaintances, work colleagues from John's office, and family, such as it was. Everyone was in shock that he had gone at such a young age, and that had been what almost everyone had said to the grieving triumvirate of Claire, Sarah and Grace. And they all seemed to follow up with, if you need anything at any time, just shout out. But Claire had found a strength she suspected was there, but had never really been pushed into using, because she depended on John. He had been her strength, the decision maker, 
the organiser of their finances and the person to whom they all turned to resolve any of life's problems, large or small. John Staines, an extraordinary man, a ruler, a man of strength, a much-loved family member who had left them too early. And now Claire was muddled. Chapter 2, September 2022 The family home was quite large, really, Claire mused. It boasted five bedrooms, three bathrooms, two reception rooms, a huge kitchen with separate utility room, a conservatory, a massive garden, and a feeling inside Claire that she was beginning to think and sound like an estate agent. The house was where she began her muddled phase, Claire Staines, widow of John Staines, mother of Sarah Carter and Grace Staines, outwardly quite confident and sociable, but muddled. It was while she was standing in the conservatory a week or so earlier, wondering whether to give the lawn its last cut of the year or whether to leave it another week, when she realised she actually liked living there on her own. She enjoyed her own space, enjoyed the freedom of being able to do what she wanted when she wanted. John would have said, cut the lawn now, don't wait another week. It would probably be raining and too wet in a week's time. And she would have got the lawn mower out immediately, then would have ended up giving it a second, last cut of the year because she had done it too early. In the end, she decided the last cut would be the second week in October. Then the grass was on its own until March the following year. Claire rather liked this new person, this decisive, somewhat cavalier Claire. And she knew she was going to remove John. Today, she would pack up the last of his clothes and take them to the hospice charity shop. And then she would return home and, oh, she didn't know, just do something. She was going to make this house hers, not theirs. Was this muddlement purely a feeling of liberation? She didn't think so. It felt as if it was more than that. It was more a sensation of change, of taking control, maybe. Possibly it was time to stop thinking I am muddled and start thinking I am changing. I am growing into myself. Financially, she had no worries. The house was paid for and John had been a shrewd provider. She didn't need to work. But the time had come to decide if she might want to work. She wanted to take some courses, maybe painting, maybe sewing, maybe a creative writing course, maybe even a plastering course. She wanted to rid herself of the overpowering presence of her husband. There, she'd said it. Admittedly, it was only to herself and not out loud, but she felt truly exhilarated. Claire's hands were shaking with the excitement of acknowledging that John was gone and she wasn't totally miserable about it. She could remember his face. There were many photographs dotted around the house reminding her of him daily. She couldn't really hear his voice anymore, though. She could accept her thoughts, store them inwardly, but nobody, not even Vic, must know of this total abandonment of her previous life. Outward appearances would remain the same. She would live in the same house, live in the same body. Her mind was going to fly. Mom! Grace's voice came from the hall, and Claire shouted down to tell her she was in the bedroom. Claire heard her daughter's footsteps as she ran up the stairs. Grace stared around in astonishment. Why? What? I'm clearing Dad's things out, sweetheart. It has to be done, and other people might benefit from his clothes. No, she said. You can't. It's too early. You can't. Let me ring Sarah. She'll tell you. Claire went to her and held her. Grace was rigid with shock. That was the defining moment that confirmed something really was out of kilter with Claire. Clearly their daughters hadn't yet come to terms with John's death. So why had she suddenly dismissed it and him from her life? Let's go downstairs. I'll make us a cup of tea. Claire led Grace out of the bedroom, away from the various piles of her father's clothes, and softly closed the door behind them. From now on, she would have to be more careful about what she did with anything relating to her husband, 
would have to accept that the girls were still unable to move on. Grace's expression was almost mutinous as she sat at the kitchen table. Her mother passed her a tin of biscuits along with a mug of tea. Help yourself, she said quietly, and we can talk. There's nothing to talk about, Grace snapped. You have enough room here to store his things if it upsets you so much to have them near you. Claire sighed. It's not about that. We have to let go. This is just my way of handling things and I have to do it. The hospice people were absolutely wonderful with Dad, as you know. So I'm taking everything to their charity shop. It's one way we can do something for them to say thank you. But it's also allowing me to begin a long journey of learning to live without the only man I've ever loved. I have to do this, Grace. And now is the right time. Grace took a sip of her tea and raised her eyes to meet Claire's. I know. I'm such a cow. It was just the shock of seeing all his clothes. Claire stood up and went round the table to where Grace sat. She put her arms around her and bent to kiss the top of her daughter's head. Grace sighed such a deep, deep sigh. I'm not sure I can help you, she said, and Claire smiled at her. I don't need your help. I'm quite capable of sorting things. Now, let's talk about the new apartment you've been to see. Grace and Megan had been together for three years, living in a tiny little house they rented from Megan's parents. It had taken John some time to accept their relationship. He had eventually come to like Megan, but even at the end, Claire didn't think he really understood that Grace had made her choice just as much as Sarah had made with Greg. And now they were about to take the next step by sealing a deal on a new apartment overlooking the river in the city centre. We complete on Friday, she said. That's really what I came to see you about. We're going to see it again tomorrow. Measure windows and floors and such, so Megan thought you might like to come with us. I'd absolutely love to, Claire said, relieved that for the moment Grace's mind seemed to have diverted itself from the issue of John's effects. I'm going to be having a bit of a clear out here, so if there's anything you want... Claire looked at Grace's face and knew she'd done it again. What? Grace said. What are you doing, Mum? Are you trying to get rid of Dad altogether? Claire's mind guiltily jumped back to the fleeting thoughts of only minutes earlier when she had acknowledged that that was exactly what she was doing. She gently touched her daughter's hand. Grace, my love, one person living alone does not need the clutter and such like that two people need. I might even decide to move from here eventually. It's a massive house and much better suited to a family. All of that's in the future. For now, I feel I need to step aside from the grief, the months of knowing your dad was going to leave me. I need some peace and a little bit of me time. And the things you can have for the apartment are nothing to do with dad dying anyway. They're simply surplus to requirements. Grace nodded, but Claire didn't know whether it was in agreement with what she had said or whether it was just a nod. A car horn hooted outside and she jumped up. That's Megan. She said she would call here first before going home. Is that okay? Claire looked at her in surprise. Why on earth do you need to ask? Megan is just as welcome here as you are. Grace gave a small apologetic shrug of her shoulders. Dad and Claire's brain cells temporarily froze. She had thought John's attitude towards Grace and Megan's partnership had been known only to her. I am not your father. The words came out much harsher than she really intended, and Grace looked at her, her blue eyes wide open. As long as you are happy, I don't care who you are with. For goodness sake, Grace, I could shake you. That would be child abuse. She grinned. You better believe it, she retorted, relieved to be back in their usual banter. It was only after the girls had left that Claire decided the time had come to look at John's office. He had always done quite a bit of work from home and had spent a small fortune turning one of the bedrooms into his office. 
It was, however, a beautiful room as a result. The walls were lined with bookshelves, and these were filled not only with the law books necessary for his work as a solicitor, but also many works of fiction, both modern and old. Since his death, she had been into dust a couple of times, but she now wanted to look at it from a more practical point of view. The first thing Claire needed to do was contact one of the new partners at Stain Solicitors and ask them if they wanted John's legal books. Once the books were gone, she could reevaluate the available space and design it to fit her own needs, the needs she had never been allowed to have when John was alive. She knew it would never have occurred to him that she might want to do something other than look after him and their daughters. The provider provided, and his feeling was that his wife should be grateful she had such an easy life. Claire went down to the garage and brought up several cardboard boxes. She made the phone call to David Barker, the new owner of John's practice, and arranged for someone to call round and collect the books the following day. She packed them into six boxes, trying to even out the weight, then tugged them down into the hall. Claire felt nothing as she looked at them, stacked as tidily as she could manage. David had said they would be invaluable to the new young solicitor they'd just brought in, so the only feeling she had about them was thankfulness that they would be of use. She tried to picture John using them, but couldn't. She really couldn't. Shaking her head, she went back into the office and just stood. Enough had been done for one day. Claire was already nursing a hefty bruise on one arm from trying to get the heaviest box downstairs, and she decided to leave everything just as it was for now. It was something of a shock to realise how empty the room looked, and yet all she had removed were his books. She ran the palm of her hand along the polished surface of John's desk and decided it would have to be moved. She needed to accommodate a sewing machine, yet still retain the desk for general things such as paying bills and such like. It would be a pleasure to use the desk. It was an early Victorian, highly polished item of furniture that she and John had seen one day while having a stroll through the antiques quarter, looking for a card table. John had managed to get it reduced by a hundred pounds, and the previous owners agreed to deliver it. John had loved working at it, said it suited him much more than the more modern one he used at work. The room boasted two windows on one long wall, quite high, and the desk would fit nicely underneath one of them, while the other would take a work surface to hold her machine. She felt quite excited by the prospect of redesigning the room. The empty bookshelves would soon be refilled. She could picture bolts of fabric, boxes of thread stored in a colour-coded way, books of every description. All of John's fiction books could remain in situ until she sorted through which ones she had read. Then they could go to the charity shop. Despite feeling that she had done enough for one day, she retrieved a can of spray polish and a duster from the utility room and quickly cleaned the shelves. The room now smelt much fresher and Claire finally went to bed with her head full of plans. Muddled plans, of course. Chapter 3, September 2022 Claire felt pleased as she waved goodbye to Andy, the young man sent from David's firm the following morning. It had only taken a few minutes to load the boxes of books into his car, They'd made a huge pile in the hallway, and she knew if they stayed there any longer, she would get another round of sorrowful expressions and chastisement from the girls if either of them dropped by. What they didn't see. David rang later to say how pleased he was with them, and they were already in place on their office bookshelves. He thanked Claire and said the business would be donating to Cancer Research as she would take no money for the books. They had made polite chit-chat, wished each other well for the future, and Claire came away from the call feeling that the final link to John had been severed. She had really and truly loved him. They'd met at infant school, as a lot of youngsters of their generation did, and grew together. She'd never looked at another man. Oh, who was she kidding? She lusted after David Beckham, tattoos and all. And they'd had a good life. Their daughters, of course, made it complete. If their son had lived beyond his allotted two days on this earth, life would have been blissful. Daniel had been a full-term baby, just not meant for this world. They had held him while he simply faded away on that awful day just before Christmas 1999. 
They were even close enough to weather that storm. After Claire's exertions with the books, she napped for an hour on the sofa in her new room and dreamt of John, the dream no doubt brought on by the offloading of his things. The dream wasn't clear when she awoke, and she quickly dismissed it. After getting her brain into gear, she took a really good look around. She decided to ask Grace and Megan for help with moving the desk when they called to collect her for the proposed apartment visit. Everything else she could manage for herself. Once the desk was in its permanent place under the left-hand window, the room would be ready for work tables and other such items. She would design the room around the desk. She was feeling quite elated and pleased with herself, but then she heard the front door open and knew Grace and Megan had arrived. Her heart sank. She hoped there would be no more recriminations. She could hear their excited chatter as they went through to the kitchen, and she called for them to come upstairs and join her. They stood just inside the doorway and surveyed the empty room. I want to put the desk under the window, she said. I know your dad liked it in the middle of the room, but that was because he was always on the move, using books from the shelves and stuff. I need the centre of the room clear, so can I borrow you two and have help moving it, please? Grace looked miserable, but they came to stand by her and the three of them began the mammoth job of moving the desk. It was heavy and they dragged rather than carried it. Claire loved how it looked, so much better in front of that massive window, and she would be able to see outside when she was sitting at it. Even Grace grudgingly agreed it looked good. Megan playfully punched her on the arm. Shut up, misery. I'm on your mum's side with this. She needs this room to work for her. What else do you have planned for it, Claire? I need a couple of flat surfaces, one for my sewing machine and one for cutting out on. I need a big cupboard for storage and that will get me started. I can add things as and when. Grace looked around her. It's a lovely room. It certainly is, and that's why I'm going to use it. Your dad loved to be in here, and I'm sure I'll be the same. He put a lot of thought and money into this room to make it special, and there's no reason I shouldn't benefit from that now. Do you miss him, Mum? That's a silly question, Grace. You know I do. But at some point, we have to live again. He's never coming back. He'll live on in my heart and I'll carry on thinking about him every day of my life. And in here, his special room, he'll always be with me. Lies. Both Grace and Megan hugged her, so she must have sounded convincing. They went downstairs together, and she chose to follow them to their new apartment in her own car. Rather than clamber into the back of their tiny little Igo, they parked side by side, and the three women walked over to the edge of the car park and looked down onto the river. Claire stayed a moment longer than the girls, watching some ducks swimming by, and thought how lovely the view would be on a gloriously hot summer's day. Today wasn't that day. It was quite cool, and she hurried to catch Grace and Megan up before they reached the lift. The apartment wasn't huge, but it had two bedrooms and a beautifully proportioned open-plan living area, they walked through the door and immediately the tape measures were produced. Claire had the responsibility of writing all the measurements down and she insisted they use both metric and feet and inches. They laughed at her, but she had been caught out before with measurements that made no sense to the English brain. So, you complete on Friday? Grace nodded. You certainly do. That's why they let us have a key. And we can't wait. Well, don't forget my offer. If you're short of anything, I'm sure I'll have got it. Claire thought about the tiny property they were currently living in. Have you enough furniture for here? We're bringing our sofa. I know it will look a bit lost in all this space, but we'll get a new one eventually. We have kitchen chairs for visitors. <laughs> Megan laughed. They're used to it. They were clearly very happy, and so together it made Claire feel quite envious. She handed Grace a cheque. She looked at it and then at her mother. Why? I mean, we can't take this, Mum. Why not? It's your inheritance. You'll have it one day, so why not now when you need it? And before you say anything, I have another one here. 
Claire waved a similar piece of paper for Zara and Greg for exactly the same amount. Grace handed it to Megan, and Megan's eyes widened. Claire? Megan King, don't go all soppy on me. When I married John, his parents were already dead, but my parents gave us £150. It was a lifeline because we had nothing. John was a very junior solicitor, and I worked in a shop, so money was short. I remember that feeling, and that's why I'm helping you out now. Grace took Megan's hand. We can have a new suite, a sofa with matching chairs, or even a corner unit. Oh, my God, Megan, we'll be able to sit down properly. The expressions on their faces made Claire laugh. Just remember, whatever you have from me now won't be here when I'm gone. You're going nowhere, Grace walked across and kissed Claire. They had thought that about her father, but Claire said nothing. They finished taking the measurements and agreed to meet up in the Marks and Spencer's cafe on Fargate for something to eat and maybe some shopping. It was a good lunch. They chatted, talked about a concerted trip to Ikea and both cars so that Claire's larger vehicle could carry any major purchases they were likely to make. And then she left them after making a joke about their car not having a boot large enough to fit all their Marks and Spencer bags in it, never mind a big blue Ikea bag. Claire arrived home, collected her mail from the mailbox on the back of the door and headed for the kitchen. She made herself a pot of coffee and sat down at the kitchen table, feeling marginally relieved that Grace appeared to be coming round from the sight of her mother folding up her father's clothes ready for the charity shop. It had been a happy day, and Claire hugged that thought to herself, feeling so much better than she had after the fallout with Grace. There was a light tap at the kitchen door, and then she heard the immortal words, It's me! Fortunately, years of hearing the phrase told her it was Vic, and she stood to unlock the door. Vic shivered as she entered the kitchen. Bloody freezing out there! Thought it was supposed to be autumnal September! She grumbled. No, it's not bloody freezing. It's not even classed as cold if you put on a jacket, numpty. But I'm only crossing from my house to yours. Okay, I give in. She flashed a smile at her friend. Coffee? If it's too early for gin, I'll settle for coffee. It is. And I might need to hear what's wrong with you before you get the gin inside you. How did you know something was wrong? I can tell. I've known you for God knows how many years now and I've always been able to tell when something's wrong. I'm assuming it's Rob. Vic's nod was barely discernible. I've told him I'm leaving. What? What happened to the plan to make him leave so that you could stay in the house? She knew that a look of concern was clear on her face. Vic hooked her long auburn hair behind her right ear and turned her head slightly. He did this. The bruise was evident, despite the layer of makeup Vic had applied. Claire felt lost for words. She reached out a hand and held back Vic's hair, looking closely. The skin isn't broken. Why did he do this? Because I said I'm leaving. He's convinced it's to move in with another man. He can't seem to understand that I simply don't like him. He makes me unhappy. We never talk we have no shared interests at all. I've found a little flat to rent until I get some money from the house, and then I'm off. It never occurred to me he'd be violent. I didn't think he'd got that much energy, if I'm brutally honest. It's mainly the horrible things, he says. He's so nasty. Never has a decent word to say, and I've had enough. I'll give up the house to get some semblance of happiness and relief into my life. I went to see the flat yesterday, Pay the deposit, and it's mine now. I told them I needed to move quickly, but when I said that, it was really because I didn't want to change my mind. But last night he hit me hard enough to knock me to the ground, and I knew there was no going back. Where is he now? At work. I'd like to be gone by the time he comes home tonight, but I didn't want to just disappear. I had to tell you, to let you know my side of things before he comes barreling round here tonight to see what you know. Then don't tell me. I'm better at acting dumb if I know nothing. I expect texts every hour on the hour to let me know you're okay. 
And as soon as he's accepted, you're gone. You can tell me where you are, okay? She poured the coffee and handed the mug to Vic. You want something in it? Vic shook her head. No, I need a clear head. The gym was only a joke. I rang in at work this morning and told them I'm not well, and I'll be back as soon as I can. But I'll go in and tell them the truth once I can think straight. She sighed. This is massive, Claire. I'm scared, but I'm feeling lighter for doing this. The flat is nice, just one bedroom, but it's all I need for the moment. Vic sipped at her coffee, gathering her thoughts. And there's a car park in the courtyard area around the back, so even my car is hidden from view. I'll be fine, I know I will. It frightened me, Claire. It was so unexpected, and I didn't even have time to get out of the way of his fist. The tears started to rain down her face, and Claire pushed some tissues across. This happened last night. You should have come here straight away. I didn't. I didn't want him going for you as well. He was in a right old temper, believe me. I've got a baseball bat. Vic snorted as she erupted with laughter and wiped her eyes in an attempt to recover from her misery. I'd forgotten about that. You're right. It would have helped. You still keep it by the front door. I do, but only because I've never thought to put it away. John was often away, so she'd followed his instructions to put it there, because she would often be in the house on her own. I'll chuck it in the bin tomorrow. I've never really wanted it anyway. Vic drained her mug and stood. I knew you'd make me feel better. I'm going to get in my car and go. I've loaded it to the hilt with stuff, bedding and towels, the immediate things I'll need. And I'll get out of the way before Rob comes home. Let me know if he comes looking for me, will you? Claire nodded. If he turns up here, I'll make damn sure he knows I've seen your face and it's a new edition of a bruise. Vic leaned to kiss her friend's cheek. Thanks, partner. I'll be in touch later. And when I'm settled and sorted, I'll tell you where I am. Then I can make you a ginless coffee. Chapter 4, September 2022 Claire stood at the window until she saw Vic's car disappear from view, then walked slowly upstairs. She wanted to get the office sorted quickly, but needed measurements for the table she planned to buy that would become her cutting-out surface, whatever it may be that she was cutting out. Claire had always enjoyed crafting. It had been her escape from the housewifely role she knew John wanted from her. Having the girls had been a blessing for him. It had meant she had to stay home to look after them, and he got all his home comforts. His promotion shortly after their wedding had seen their income double almost overnight, and from that time onwards he had tried to get her to become the housewife he wanted. She'd fought his plans until she became pregnant with Sarah, but then gave in to the inevitable. She had taken to crafting to fill in the endless hours. She taught herself to crochet, became adept at knitting Aaron jumpers, and went to various craft classes. She had loved the patchwork class, but John had complained at the fabric everywhere, and so she had let that hobby drift away. But now, contemplating the desk up in the office room, she considered resurrecting her undoubted talents in that activity. She opened the office door and drank in the feel and the smell of it, brought on by consecutive days of polishing the shelves. She walked across to the window that would cast natural light on whatever was eventually put in place to be her workstation, and looked out at the front garden. She fancied having a little bistro set out there, John had said nobody sat in their front gardens, even if it did get sun most of the day. It simply wasn't done. It was too public. People sat in their back gardens, and so they'd bought a comfortable dining seating set for the rear patio. But why waste sunshine? She felt she could sit quite happily in the front, and if it literally was a small table and two chairs, she could move them to wherever she wanted them to be either in full glorious heat or in the shade if it got too fully gloriously hot. As she stared out of the window, she mentally planned a trip to a garden centre, credit card in hand and ready to be used. She could feel John in this room, 
despite the removal of his books and the rearranged furniture. But she couldn't hear him any longer, or had she simply stopped listening? The length of wall available to her was a little...